Thank you. Right, so um, I'll be talking about uh, cloud computing. Now, cloud computing has been a pretty hot topic for the last little while in our industry. Um, but of course, it, it does come with some problems. It, it brings new, uh, it makes things more efficient, and it makes things more flexible. Uh, but, it, but in the end, if we want to make sure that the cloud, the internet, is open, there's a few things we need to do. We've just seen that we need to fix the RP layer. That's very important. I'm going to talk about the layer above that. Um, so let's look at these problems, right? Privacy is the obvious uh, problem that uh, is all around the media. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about this one. Um, you can look any sort of tech publication and, and you'll hear lots about this one. Uh, I'm more interested in this problem, the problem of autonomy, of control. What does it mean to you as a user when the, uh, the, the software that you use to, um, to do stuff on your data, the software that you use to do your work every day, is no longer under your control? There is no longer free software. So in particular, so what I, so what I want to talk about really is, is sort of an approach to bring freedom back into the cloud. Now let's look, for example, at what it means for uh, your service provider to be running free software on their servers. Does it matter? What sort of freedoms does it give you? Well, it's not clear because, um, of course, on a regular computer, on a laptop, on a desktop, um, we have a pretty good idea of what it means for software to be free, what sort of things you get out of this. For, if we look at a license like the GPL, we have a fairly good understanding of what it means, right? In very simple terms, it means that if you, uh, if you give the software to someone else, give them a copy, it needs to come with source code and the same sort of conditions, or the same uh, uh, requirements and freedoms. But if we look at the case of a service provider using free software on their servers and you accessing this, it's slightly different. And the difference is that the trigger for the GPL, for the, the reciprocal clause of the GPL, is on the copy. And when you're using a web service, you're not actually making a copy. You're providing some input to the service, and you're getting some output, but you're not making a copy. So the, G, so the GPL would never kick in, right? You don't have to provide, so the service provider doesn't, doesn't have to provide source code. A couple of people have um, thought about this problem and came up with a solution to bring back the idea of copyleft, the reciprocal nature of the GPL, to the cloud world. And that is a new license that they call the Eferal GPL. Now, the Eferal GPL is almost exactly the same as the GPL, except for one very important difference, which is this. If you put something under the Eferal GPL and a user modifies it, then they must give um, the source code to anybody who uh, uses the, the service over the internet. Which means that if you modify the software, you can't keep your modifications closed. You need to release them if, user, if users request them. What does that, does that look like in practice? Well, here's an example of a piece of software that is under the AGPL and it releases source code. Um, this is from um, StatusNet, and basically what they do is they put a link to the license and the footer of their pages, and they put a link to uh, the source code as well. So it's not too onerous if you, if you, if you do it right um, this way. Right, so, okay, we've got a couple of tools. We've got a, an entirely free software server stack. We've got a new license that has a copyleft um, a component to it. We have free browsers, and we have sexy web 2.0 frameworks. Where do we start? It turns out that a number of people have already started uh, working towards this free cloud. And what they've done is they've, they've taken a number of proprietary services one by one and started providing free alternatives. Here's a couple. Um, Twitter has a free software replacement called Identica. How many people know Identica? Okay, quite a few people. Uh, GitHub has Gitorious and Affair. Blogger has a number of products, including WordPress, uh, Branchable. The project hosting sites like SourceForge and Google Code. There's, a, there's an AGPL equivalent called Launchpad, which Ubuntu uses and funds. Um, SurveyMonkey has Lime Survey, Google Maps, OpenStreetMaps. 
etc. Last of family, refam, delicious, cuddle. Um, Facebook might have something that replaces it someday. And other critical services um, down there. Now, I was personally looking for a small one because I was uh, trying to get started with this and figured out that you know the, the very first one that I do, I want it to be pretty small. So I started looking around for, um, for services that were not free software, that were quite um, useful out there. And I picked Gravatar. How many people use Gravatar or are there any application or have an account in Gravatar? Okay, a couple of people. Um, so, so for those of you who don't know, what Gravatar is, is it's simply a website where you create an account, you upload your photo, and then you sign it to your email address. And what happens after you've done this is that all of a sudden, on a whole bunch of websites on the internet, you'll see your photo appear. And the way they do this, for example, on, the, on this site, on Olo, they don't actually allow you to upload your own photo. What they do instead is they just um, take your email address, and then they'll go fetch the photo from Gravatar directly. And so you upload your photo once, and it shows up all over the web. If you want to change your photo, you just change it on one website, and it changes all over. Which means that if you want your photo to appear next to a comment that you put on someone else's blog, well, if they're using Gravatar, then uh, it will appear automatically. You don't have to upload your photo all over the place. That's quite a cool system. And the, uh, the, the API for developers is really, really simple. Here's how it works. You take the email address as entered by the user, you lowercase it, you take an MD5 sum of it, you turn that into a URL, you can probably see where that's going, you stick that into an image tag, and that's it. That's all you need to do, because that's the API. So on your site, you have uh, photos for your users that are hosted somewhere else, and, uh, and they get pulled in by the browsers directly. So it's quite simple. OK, so got some tools, a service to replace. What's next? Well, obviously, when you start a free software project, the very first thing you have to do is to pick a name. So I pick this name from Libra, which stands for Liberty. And I came up with a little logo as well. So the next thing I did was to look for inspiration at other free network services projects, other AGPL projects. And the one that inspired me the most was StatusNet. Now, StatusNet is the software that powers Identica, the Twitter replacement. So Identica is a native service, StatusNet is a native software that runs it. And um, they did a couple of things, right? The, uh, the, the one thing that inspired me, actually, and specifically in Identica, was, was this bug here, uh, ticket number 84, which says that if, if a user doesn't have a photo in Identica, um, Identica should default to looking at Gravatar uh, for a photo. Uh, and so I decided to, that I would fix this bug, but not using Gravatar. And um, so specifically the things that, that inspired me with StatusNet were things like they decided to replace Twitter, but to not do, they, they did not um, get, so, sort of put the burden on themselves to, to do everything that Twitter does. They decided to do the core set of features that Twitter does and to drop a couple of things. And so I'm going to do the same thing. There's a few things in Gravatar that I don't feel are as important as the other ones. So I'll just concentrate on the other things. Um, but perhaps the, the most useful insight from StatusNet was how they integrated into the existing world that they were trying to replace. How did they integrate with Twitter? Now, they did this to two things, using the same API and to, by being a Twitter client themselves. What does it mean to use the same API? Well, it means that basically it, for all of the t existing Twitter clients that are out there um, on mobile phones, desktops, etc., all they need to do really, all they need to change in their code to support Identica is this. They just need to change the base URL. Everything will work the same. So it's really easy to port your software to Identica. What does it mean to be a Twitter client? Well, Identica actually is a Twitter client, so it can post to Twitter, which means that I, uh, the, so this, this message was posted on Twitter, and, um, uh, but I actually typed it in Identica. And so in practice, what that means is that 
you don't have to wait until all of your friends have switched to Identica before you do the move yourself. You can start posting to Identica and still keep feeding the information back to your friends on Twitter. So quite a clever idea. I'm basically going to do the same thing. So I'm going to use the same API, and LibreAdvisor is also a Gravatar client. Same API means that if you're already using Gravatar in your application, that's all you need to change. Right? Just the base URL again, and it uses the same API. In terms of being a Gravatar client, what this means in this case is that if LibreAdvisor doesn't have the photo itself, it's going to redirect to Gravatar. Now, the clever thing about this is that right from launch, LibreAvatar has always had more images than Gravatar <laughs> because it has access to all of Gravatar's images. So it works quite well in practice. Now, okay, so that was about how to replace the service, how to uh, clone the most important features and so on. How about making it better? Well, of course, it is free software, so it's inherently better. <laughs> it comes with freedom. Um, but it also has a number of features that, that, that Gravatar doesn't have. Um, I think the most important one is federation by DNS. Now, the idea here is that if you control a, a domain name, for example, my employer Catalyst IT has catalyst.net.nz, you should be able to specify exactly how people are getting pictures, where they're getting pi their pictures from for your domain. So for any Catalyst employee with an email address at catalyst.net.nz, they should go to that uh, URL avatar as a catalyst that matter and that. And this is exposed in DNS through an SRV record, which is what is used for service discovery. So for example, if you want to discover some a company's LDAP server, SIP server, or something like that, this is typically the kind of records that you would use. Um, Got a couple more ideas, uh, maybe using Creative Commons licenses, the ability to license your avatar images. Um, LibreAvatar already supports more hash algorithms, and if you're concerned that MD5 is not strong enough to protect your um, user's privacy, you can just use SHA-256. Um, another idea I had was to have uh, RSS feeds for uh, changes in profile photos. Um, and another neat one is the automatic photo importer. So when you create an account on LibreAvatar, it will pull in your Gravatar image immediately, or your Identica image. Um, so that you don't even have, so if you want to switch to LibreAvatar, it's really easy. You don't even have to re-upload your photos. That gets taken care of automatically. Right, so what does it look like? I will attempt to do a live demo. <laughs> now, the wireless is a little bit slow, but hopefully it will work. So this is the main page. And just a regular login thing. Now, the first thing you do is you upload a new photo. And I'll just upload this one. <laughs> Sorry? Is it no offensive con content an oxymoron? <laughs> Possibly, yes. <laughs> All right, so let's just crop it to be like this and do this. Um, and you can upload more than one photo as well. Um, if you want. So you can have different photos with different email addresses. Um, so I'm just going to no, use the auto crop here. And then the next thing is you add your email addresses. Now I've actually cheated and added one here, but what happens is when you type in your email address, it will send an email to you with a confirmation link to make sure that you actually own that email address. And that link will look like this. And I've just been kicked out. <laughs> kicked off the wireless. Oh, there you go. We're back. Cool. Um, there we go. So this is the automatic importer in action. So it found two images. And if I check them, they'll get imported. In this case, I don't need them, so I'll just do this. Right, so now I've got a confirmed email address. I can assign a photo to it, like this. And now if we look, this is a little um, tool that I wrote to um, simulate someone using LibreAvatar in their application. So 
if you were on someone's blog and that blog software used to have just happened to use Libreta, this is what you would see. So look up here. Just clear up the cache. So there we go. Um, so this this is the hash, the MD5 hash of my email address. And if we look here, this is the URL that um, like a, a blog type of software would put on their page to display my picture. Um, now it does support HTTPS as well. If you have, if you're running over HTTPS, you should use um, this uh, URL instead because otherwise you'll have browser warnings. And uh, so let's look at another one, one that I haven't yet added to my Liberata account. So what this one does here, if you look at URL here, hopefully the wireless will work. But basically this one is, um, is a different picture because it's coming from Gravatar. So Gravatar doesn't have a photo for that email address. It does an automatic redirect to Gravatar. Um, it doesn't redirect SHA-1 and SHA-256 because uh, Gravatar doesn't support those ones. Now, finally, I'll just cancel that one. Here's another installation of Libertar. Now, this is using the Federation stuff. This is the, um, the, so the, the Avatar server for uh, my employer. And um, I'll just log into this one. Now, on this one, you can't, you obviously can't create new accounts. Um, there's an LDAP plugin, so only employees have access to this one. And so I've already assigned a photo for this one. Um, so let's have a look at a user. So again, simulating a blog software that would uh, use the right spelling. That looks good. So this is what they would see. They would, so they would see the image as served by the Catalyst uh, server here. And there we go. That's what they would put in their HTML because they would do an SRV lookup beforehand. Now, for the Catalyst server, as you can see, the HTTPS stuff is going straight to Liberata instead. That is because um, if we do a DNS lookup here, the, um, the Catalyst server only exposes um, a, on, only gives a, a, um, an avatar server for HTTP, not HTTPS, so HTTPS uh, just goes to, uh, to the regular service, the avatar. And uh, if I do, I make a typo here, then what we're gonna see is obviously a missing avatar, but as you can see, the, uh, because it's a custom installation for Catalyst.net, they can choose exactly what picture to use when, uh, when a photo is not found for one of their employees, which we see here. Um, the last thing I want to point out is this little option here, permanently delete your account. Um, I think this is really, when, you, when you're starting to replace um, services with free software ones, I think it's really important to pay attention to privacy and things like that. And uh, we kicked off the wireless again. But anyways, this does delete your account entirely. Um, and it leaves no traces of you in the database. So I think it's really important to build services like this that allow people to um, exit sort of gracefully. Right. Go back to this. So what does the uh, software look like? What you've seen was a Django application where you can uh, log in to upload your photos, etc. Um, then what happens after your photo is uploaded is it gets saved straight to disk with the, uh, the hash as the file name. So basically, all of what the application is doing is serving static files from disk directly. Um, there's, a, there's a mod rewrite component to it as well because you can do certain things like uh, specify that if the image isn't found, you want this image instead to be used as the default, stuff like that. Um, but in other words, the high traffic site is entirely static and the dynamic side of things is, is the low traffic one because people don't uh, update their photos very often, but they, their photo gets requested a lot more often than it gets updated. Now, it is a little bit uh, more complicated than this uh, because there's an extra step 
for uh, scalab scalability purposes, which is that the Django application uses a Gearman queue to put all of the slow operations, so things like crop resize, optimizing images using um, JPEG Optim and OptiPNG. Uh, those things take a bit more time, so the queue is there to make sure that only one of these operations happens at once. Um, obviously, if that becomes a bottleneck, it's really easy to scale it up and just add workers to the queue. <coughs> so what's next? Well, I mean, our, the project started um, a few months ago, but I've got lots of ideas of what to do next, and uh, specifically what I want to work on now is uh, mirrors. So basically, it's just a bunch of static files served by Apache, so it will be really easy to distribute that across the world and just do it like a twice daily rsync or something like that, uh, and then sort of scale the service up from there. Another thing that I'll do is to have a uh, plugin for IkiWiki, which is a blogging, a free software blogging platform, um, which has a commercial hosting uh, site called Branchable. And the Branchable guys are, are keen to give it a go and, and sort of try it out for real with a few users and so on. Um, then I want to create uh, a service for Debian developers. To, uh, so that will be another hosted um, instance of, of Libreta, just like the Catalyst one. So um, basically, you know, when you go to the Branchable blog, they talk with comments from Debian developers, you'll see their photo uh, pop up, things like that. Um, and if you want to get involved, there's heaps of stuff that can be done. Um, there's, um, this is just a, a couple of ideas, but um, there is a, a thing in Gravatar called Webatars, which is um, kind of a cool idea. If, you, if, if a picture is missing for someone, instead of always showing um, the same little icon for missing people, you can have a little sort of random looking pattern of, of lines and colors that is um, the same for a given hash, but is different for different hashes. So basically, you can see visually uh, that there are different people talking about stuff, even though they don't, their picture doesn't show up. And you can also associate the same, um, the messages coming from the same person uh, visually, given this uh, thing. Now, I'm not quite sure how to do this, but if anybody is keen on, on doing this, that would be quite cool. Um, I want to internationalize it as well. Um, we would like to have localization in a couple of languages as well for Django applications. Uh, if you're in Django Guru, uh, please come and talk to me and you know, if you were keen to improve the code quality and someone can do a code review. Um, writing test suite is another thing that on our to-do list. Graphic design, CSS, again, come and talk to me. It's, it, it would be great to, to improve this. Um, if you have so, some servers and you have a bit of extra disk space and you'd be willing to run a mirror, that would be great. Um, or if you have access to cheap SSL certificates. Currently, we're using, for HTTPS, we're using CA cert, which doesn't work so well for a lot of people, unfortunately. Um, and if you um, don't want to do any of this, but uh, still want to support the project, please just create an account today and upload your photo. And that's pretty much it. Now, I'm happy to take questions, and I would also like to uh, know if you have any other ideas for uh, Libratar, things you'd like to see, things you use in Gravatar, and would be cool to have, um, or if you can think of other easy services to replace. Um, now, one thing that seems uh, different to Twitter is that uh, the way the open Twitter has been implemented is that for a user, it seems that they'd currently be better off putting their account on Gravatar because it means that it would work uh, on more websites, their, their avatar would be available in more places than if they were put on your service because it doesn't have that uh, push back to Gravatar in the same way that, the, that you get with Twitter. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, you, if you want if you want it to your, your photo to appear on sites that use Gravatar and not Libratar, then uh, you should put it on both, um, and that way, you know, you've got it there. Um, the idea is that, like, yes, it, it, unfortunately, we can't do sort of both ways. But it, it, you know, I, I do have um, a, very, a very cheap solution to this, which is uh, a Grease Monkey script to uh, change the URLs on all the pages that I visit in my browser. But obviously, you know, that's, that's just for me to test it. Um, but yeah, you're right. Um, but it's the the idea is mostly that um, that this will be bootstrapped by other free software service 
uh, projects that want to support this and support sort of freedom and federated um, ideas. Um, but yeah, that's not, you know, until we convince WordPress to actually do it, um, it's not going to show up everywhere. So first of all, thanks, because it's a very interesting example of how to subvert an existing web service, adding both features and freedom. So thanks. Uh, I have a question. So how do you imagine in the final application that will need to use either Gravatar or Libre Avatar or whatever, the interface for configuring where um, avatars are coming from? I can imagine that you can, for instance, ask the administrator to specify the URL, the basic URL from which the uh, Avatar should be taken from. That's a possibility, and but and it would be also in line with the idea of having a kind of federation of these services. But then the question is, if you go that way, the idea of falling back to Gravatar to fetch an image become kind of obsolete because you no longer have a single fallback service to which look for an avatar if it does not exist on Libre Avatar or whatever. <coughs> Right, so, so each, each site, like uh, for example, the, the Catalyst site, um, currently is configured to not fall back to Veritar or Libertar and to just display the um, official Catalyst logo because that, you know, at, it's, at that point it becomes a policy that it does, what does the domain owner want, right? Um, but it could easily just redirect to Libertar, for example, and, and this, or Veritar or whatever. So there, there's the option to, to do. Uh, either one of those. So for Debian developers, possibly, it might make sense to just redirect to, to the other service. Yeah. Um, yeah, so how does the DNS SRV actually work? Does it look up the SRV records on every domain name? Like if I enter a gmail.com, it looks for avatars dot underscore tcp dot gmail dot com. And, and isn't that really slow? Like um, if you make a request for an avatar on libravatar.org, isn't it going to be really slow waiting for the DNS to time out if it doesn't exist? or? How does it work? Um, well, there, there's many things that, that can be done then uh, for, for that stuff. Um, obviously, the, 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 the cool thing about, about doing this in, um, so this is how it works, right? You just um, you dig for it, and then you can find the, the service. Um, the, the cool thing about using DNS is that DNS is designed to be extremely cacheable, and it's, it's cached all over the place. Um, obviously, with something like um, Gmail and Hotmail or whatever, which is probably going to be um, half of the email addresses, at least, that you're going to encounter you know, and add Yahoo to that mix. Um, if we do know that they're not, uh, that they don't have an SRV record, then there's a really quick um, uh, hack that you can put in there to just, you know, not do a lookup for these ones. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm part of de uh, deploying this to Branchable will be to see how, how well it scales and what else we need to do. Um, would it make sense for a big site to have their own uh, sort of lightweight DNS resolver that has a very short time out for SRV records? Maybe. Um, I don't know. I'm looking forward to having that problem. <laughs> I've got a little idea. Um, yes. I liked how you had all the little tools on the side as well to make it a lot easier to, to um, you know, query the, the images and things like that. And in that, um, in that same vein, maybe a little service to sync the avatar back up to WordPress, um, a la you know, the way that, say, LinkedIn harvest all your email addresses out of your Gmail, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't like that, and that's kind of par for the course, and so it sounds like a good thing to do. Yeah, so, so, so basically you're pushing it back to to your Google profile, to your Facebook profile, yeah, and using, all that stuff. you know, web scraping or whatever it is. Yeah, You'd yeah. be able to check it quite easily by just, you know, just doing a diff on the image or something like that, yep. so you're not trying to push it every time. Yeah, no, that's a very good idea. Mm. 
I'm sure if you, anyone wants to have a talk to uh, Francois afterwards, they can grab him for a chat. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to Francois for talking to us today. It's a small token of our appreciation. And give Francois a round of applause.